Our second scripture today comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 18, verses 33 through 37. I invite you to follow along with me as we hear a word from the Lord. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, we pray that you would speak your words to us this morning. May the words of my mouth and the meditations on all of our hearts be acceptable unto you. For you, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So this week I've been thinking about what it means to belong to someone, what it means to belong to a family, to belong to a community, to belong to one another. One of the reasons I've been thinking about this is these questions is because, um, as we said, today marks the three-year anniversary of the day the girls moved in with us. For the record, I've been telling people it was the four-year anniversary. I miscounted. I mean, I guess it feels like longer. I don't know. It's three, which is crazy. So for those of you who don't know our story, I just, want to, I just want to tell it to you very briefly. So on November 23rd, 2010, three girls walked into our house in West Virginia. They were 15, almost 16, just turned five and six. They walked into our house at six o'clock into a house filled with people. It was the day before Thanksgiving, and uh, six of my seven siblings, uh, one of my nieces and nephew were there, and uh, about five more people would come the next day. So they came to us um, already two months into being in the system from another foster family in, uh, in the same county. Um, and as Dwight and I like to say, they, they walked into our home and then they walked straight into our hearts. When they moved in, we had no idea how long they would be with us. You never know when foster children come in how long they're going to stay. They were not adoptable at that point. That is, the state had not yet decided whether or not uh, they were going to terminate the rights of their biological parents. A few weeks after they moved in with us, we were down in North Carolina visiting Dwight's family for Christmas, and our oldest daughter, Amira, uh, asked us if we would become her guardian. She was very clear, as every 16-year-old is, that she did not want to be adopted. She was too old and really had been finished being parented by then. Though we've parented her just a little bit since then, right? Yeah. Uh, she, didn't, she didn't want to go back to her biological family, but she also didn't want to be adopted. She simply wanted somebody to be her guardian and to help her with her citizenship when the time came. Two weeks after that, she asked us, uh, while we were at my parents' house, if we would adopt her. And our answer was always that we would do whatever she wanted us to do. About two months into their living with us, I remember uh, having a conversation with Dwight. I was in Florida on a business trip, and Dwight was at home with the girls. I don't remember what happened to make us have this conversation. Uh, but it reminded me about a conversation I'd had right before... Um, right after we'd started dating. We'd only been dating for a month. And uh, I turned to Dwight and said to him, just so you know, we're going to get married. <laughs> so when you're ready, you just let me know. <laughs> it's going to happen, like whether or not you know it now or not. That's pretty much the way our relationship works, right? And we discovered that, that we kind of um, know when those things happen at different times. We know when we belong to each other in different ways. So that was about a, a month into our dating. So about two months after the girls moved in with us, uh, I had a conversation with Dwight where I said to him, just so you know, the girls already belong to us. Whether or not you know that, I don't know. But just so you know, they're not going anywhere. And we were right. We, uh, so four months later... Four months into our journey with them, we were told that we were moving here to Cockeysville. We knew that Amira was going to be able to come with us because we were already working on her adoption at that point, but we were unsure what would happen with the younger girls. 
We knew in our hearts that they belonged with us because they already belonged to us, but the state thought a little differently, and so we had to fight a little more to get them back with us. The rest, as they say, is history. They are now legally ours, and we give thanks for that. But they were ours before the papers were signed. Today we celebrate an important festival in the life of the church. Today is Christ the King Sunday. It is an important but a relatively new festival in the life of the church. We've been celebrating Christmas for hundreds of years, but Christ the King Sunday didn't happen until 1925, when the Pope at the time, Pope Pius XI, put out a fancy piece of paper and used a lot of words to institute this new celebration. When you think about when it was started, it makes perfect sense because at the time, Mussolini was gaining popularity and fascism was gaining ground in Europe. So the Feast of Christ the King was supposed to affirm once and for all that Christ rules all, not Mussolini or Hitler, but Christ is the king over all creation. That's what the Pope wanted them to celebrate. So it was instituted then for the Catholic Church, but mainline Protestant churches didn't really start celebrating it until the 1980s, when the revised common lectionary became popular. So the origins of Christ the King are simple enough, right? Christ is King, not Mussolini. But the challenge doesn't stop for us there. For us, it's supposed to remind us that Christ is the King, nothing else. That Christ is King, not death or violence or consumerism. That Christ is King and we ourselves are members of that kingdom, subject to Christ alone. So this morning, in this brief moment before the penitence of Advent and the joy of Christmas begin, we are invited to stop and reflect on what it means to know that Christ is the King in our lives and in our world. I think it was a courageous statement for the Pope to make, to make this as a day when we stop and name Christ as King in a world where other people were claiming their own supremacy and importance. It was a call to rethink one's own identity and allegiance to think about who you ultimately belonged to. I think the heart of the gospel lesson is about belonging and identity. The week before Advent, it seems like kind of a strange passage for us to start with because in a few weeks, we're going to be celebrating the birth of Christ. But today, we have a passage that happens right before Christ's crucifixion. It's the passage that ultimately determines that Christ will be crucified. This interaction between Pilate and Jesus found in the Gospel John has a lot of interesting pieces to it. It's a struggle between Pilate uh, and Jesus, between doing what is right and doing what is expected. It's a struggle between two kinds of power, one of political might and one of humility. And I think it is about identity and at its very heart about belonging. Pilate is trying to determine if Jesus claims to be the king of the Jewish nation. After all, that's the charge that the Sanhedrin council brought before Pilate when they brought Jesus to him and asked him to execute him. They knew that claiming to be king would be seen as a threat to the Roman emperor and would warrant death. But Jesus, in his usual fashion, never answers Pilate's questions outright. Instead, he answers with more questions and then with things that really seem to have nothing to do with the questions that Pilate asked. Really, I think they're having this conversation on two different levels. Pilate is asking about a physical kingdom and a physical king, a king like the emperor, but Jesus is talking in theological terms about a kingdom that is not earthly bound. Ultimately, Jesus ends by saying to him that he and his followers belong to the truth. So what does it mean to belong to something? Well, the dictionary gives a couple of different definitions. It tells us that to belong to something means to be in the relation of a member, adherent, or inhabitant, like we belong to Epworth United Methodist Church. Or to have the proper qualifications, uh, especially social qualifications, to be in a group like you don't belong in this club because you don't know how to play chess, right? It means uh, to be in the property of something. This book belongs to her, or to be appropriately placed or situated, that belongs on the shelf. Questions of belonging and identity are crucial to us as human beings. Children know this inherently from when they're very little because they test it. How many of you ever told your parents you were going to run away? Anybody want to admit it? A couple? Look, mostly it's the youth that are admitting. Good job, guys. 
<clears throat> they used to tell you, when your children told you to run away, that you were supposed to um, help talk to them about it logically. Like you could help pack the suitcase and say, where are you going to go when you run away? And how are you going to eat? And how will you make money? So that eventually they would figure out that they, they really had nowhere to go, that it didn't make logical sense, and they would change their mind. Now some of the advice tells you to remind them that they can't leave because we belong to each other. We belong together. But we test it in lots of different ways, that sense of belonging. We test it in our families. We test our belonging to communities of faith, to our nation. And we do it in lots of ways. As adults, sometimes we leave relationships to test them, whether we leave for a few hours to figure things out and come back, or whether we ultimately leave permanently. People test their belonging to faith communities, offering ultimatums, while others drift away quietly, wondering if anyone is going to notice that they're gone. All of us test our belonging in some way. Now, you'll notice that all of the examples I've given focus on the individual and on the individual's ability to make decisions. There is a profound emphasis on the individual in our American culture that I think is at odds with the kind of belonging that Jesus is talking about in this passage when he says that those who belong to the truth listen to his voice. We have to remember when we read these words that Jesus lived in a different culture, in a time and a place where what was emphasized was not the individual, but the community. In the world of the New Testament, a person did not think of himself or herself as an individual who acts alone regardless of what others think or say, but rather they were always aware of the expectations of others, of the expectations of the community. One theologian describes it this way, a group embedded, group oriented, collectivistic personality, one who needs another simply to know who he or she is. I love that last part, one who needs another simply to know who he or she is. This is the world that Jesus lives in when he says these words. When Jesus tells Pilate that all who listen to Jesus' voice belong to the truth and are a part of the kingdom, he is saying that belonging is less about our individual decisions and more about collective participation in a community that transcends itself, that the reign of God's kingdom is larger than any individual within it. So then participating in, belonging to that kind of community means that we have to behave in a different way. Jesus gives us clues all along his ministry as to what this kind of kingdom looks like. He says it looks like a woman who loses one coin but spends all night looking for it, and when she finds it, she throws a party and invites her neighbors to share in her joy. It looks like a shepherd who leaves behind the 99 to look for one lost sheep. It looks like the neighbor who cares for the one he dislikes as if he's caring for himself. It looks like the one who feeds the hungry and gives water to the thirsty, who clothes the naked and visits the sick and imprisoned. It looks like the one who is with those who mourn and with the poor and with those who are meek. It looks like the one who chooses forgiveness over vengeance, grace over exclusion, love over punishment. It looks like the one who includes the brokenhearted and the left out and the forgotten. It looks like the place where everybody knows your name because it looks like the place that everyone belongs. That's where the kingdom of God is present. Wherever we experience the reign of God through God's invitation to us of healing and wholeness and restoration. The good news in this is that our belonging isn't up to any individual's decisions, not one another's decisions, and not even our own. It's up to God. Our belonging is already decided by God. That, I think, is the new reality that Jesus proclaims loudly to Pilate. That's the new truth to which all of us, the community of those invited, healed, and restored, belong. So here's what I want you to know today. Just like the two conversations I had with Dwight, you already belong to God. Whether you know it or feel it or not, it's already happened. So the question for us at the end of the day isn't, do you belong? It is this, do we live like we belong? 
Because ultimately, belonging to God's kingdom isn't about a piece of paper. It's not about a passport or an ID card or a location. It's about the way that we live, the way that we treat one another. So do you live like you belong to the world, or do you live like you belong to God? To belong to this kind of kingdom and to be subject to this kind of king is to experience an extraordinary liberation and an exciting new outlook on life. Sometimes we will know and feel right away that we belong. Sometimes it will take us a while to remember. I love in the story of the prodigal son, it says he came to himself. And sometimes that's what has to happen to us. We have to come to our senses, to come to ourselves, to remember that we already belong. Whether we know it or feel it in any given moment, we already belong to God. So let's live like we belong. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.